This is our last panel before our last time in the Word, and uh, the way we want to frame this panel is under the banner of next steps, and uh, our hope is just to give some, hopefully, pastoral encouragement, in a sense, uh, when it comes to where to go from here. And so, I want, to, I want us to think about that in, in kind of a broad and then a more narrow way. So, a broad way just for anybody, no matter where they're going from here, what God may be leading them to do. Like, how do you walk away from a conference like this? How do you walk away from these few days? Uh, what are the exhortations there? And then specifically for those who believe God may be leading them to go uh, as a missionary for the spread of the gospel where it's not yet gone. So I want to get there more narrow, but we'll start more broadly. So just, uh, I think we, we just heard clear exhortation about go to your church and be in the church. And so I, I know every brother up here would echo that uh, heartily. Uh, anything you would add to that? I mean, Tripp obviously covered that really well, but is there anything else that you would add just even practically what that looks like? Well, in, in the broadest sense, I think what I would exhort, and Tripp hit on this a little bit too in his fifth point, um, is obey your conscience. So you've been here, the Word's been alive, Spirit has been making the Word alive, Spirit has been impressing upon you certain convictions. They could be deeply personal in terms of confessing and repenting of sin. Um, they could be strategic in terms of particular conversations that you need to have back at home with your church or things of that sort. Um, I would encourage you to document that, journal that, uh, and follow the Lord's leading through His Word in that way. It'd be really easy to be that man who looks in the mirror, sees his reflection, turns away, and forgets what he saw. Or it'd be really easy for the birds of the air to snatch the seed, uh, and we lose the profit of God's Word sown uh, into our lives since we've been, we've been here. So it may seem obvious, but um, commit yourself to obeying what the Lord has been showing you in His Word and in your life. That's a really good word. Uh, that I just, uh, so I just want to echo, um, it's, it's, um, it's dangerous to get in any kind of pattern. And I think we do this sometimes like Sunday after Sunday, where we just go, we feel convicted, oh man, that really hit me. And then we kind of move on and life looks the same, and then we come back for another dose the next Sunday. Oh, that was, that was really convicting. And it's like, this is not Christianity though, this is this is, this is James 1 kind of foolishness. And so I would wholeheartedly echo, and I was talking with somebody earlier, uh, just on a personal level, uh, journaling is uh, a part of my daily time with the Lord, and I, I would say it's been massively impactful for keeping me uh, accountable to really reflecting and applying and then sharing some of the things, not, but sharing that with somebody else. So great word. Yeah, Zane. I just want to echo and say amen to everything that Tripp had to say. And as you're thinking about even the process of going, it's the church that sends missionaries. So if you're not engaged in a church, you're, you're not, literally not qualified. Uh, it's the church that discerns your maturity, your readiness, your gifting. Uh, it's the church that sends you, and they send you to make disciples. And it, if you cannot, and I believe he's absolutely right, you cannot make disciples biblically outside the context of a church. So that you are sent by the church to engage and be and plant and be a part of the church where you go. So literally it is impossible to do biblical missions without church on both ends. You gotta have it both places. And you as a missionary need the church as much as any other disciple. One of the things I have seen has been folks who somehow bought into the hype that as, as a missionary you're a super Christian. Uh, let me assure you that we are not, like not even remotely. And we need the church for our own perseverance and maturity and accountability every bit as much as somebody, as any other believer. And a church that's halfway around the world that I'm a member of doesn't fill that need. I need church where I am. That's good. I, I would encourage, too, along those lines, you go to your church and you say, I think that God may be leading me. And maybe your church leaders say, ah, we don't really see it. Like, we see some things in your life that 
uh, maybe need to grow, like receive that. Uh, I would say humbly, I mean, examine your heart with the word and uh, let the Lord use this as a sanctifying process. So it's not a uh, never, uh, but it's a, okay, then what do I need to do to grow in some certain areas? So let the Lord do that sanctifying work. What other general encouragement would you guys give? Just in the context of this conference specifically, uh, firstly, for a nanosecond, I got confused because I thought John Piper was meant to answer questions first. But um, <laughs> You're replacing. Uh, uh, we yeah, should yeah, start <laughs> with you. <laughs> the meeting. Um, this conference, if there's anything like a pep rally, it would be this as opposed to your local church. Amen. Amen. It's a, an Everest kind of experience especially if it's your first time. So we're gonna go away, all wound up, ready to go on the plane tomorrow, right? But it starts with baby steps now, right? Small steps now. Uh, as you leave, as you fill up the, the petrol, no, gas, it's gas here, isn't it? We fill up gas tanks here. You go to the petrol, the gas attendant, and you, you actually start to say hello and, and be loving in that context. And, and if someone cuts in front of you on the road, you're not just going to go off in impatience because that's normal life, right? I start with holiness now, right? Amen. Baby steps now after this Everest experience. I go home and I, I tidy up my room. I, I actually honor my mum and dad. Uh, I, I'd be loving to my siblings. It, I, it starts small here, and we've talked about big things, but holiness begins with the mundane, with the ordinary, with how you treat one another now. The second thing I want to say is, if I, if I may turn to the book, if I could, I just want to read to you Colossians 1, verse 9 and following. And this is so special to me because, you see, Paul didn't actually know the Colossians face-to-face -face apart from one or two people. Right. So this is the kind of prayer that you pray for anybody you don't know, Christian brothers and sisters. I don't know most of you, even though many of you are so kind to come up to me and speak to me. But he says in verse 9 of chapter 1, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Just pause there, and then I want to come back very quickly to verse 11. Please note that what he is praying for is firstly that we fill with the knowledge of his will. His will in the scriptures. I can spend hours talking about that, but that's what it's talking about. Not about who your future spouse is specifically, but who is at the center of his will, namely that Jesus is at the center of his will, then Jesus is your treasure, and thinking his thoughts after him in the rest of scripture. Firstly is that you're filled with the knowledge of his will, so keep reading the word. Please don't think that you've heard the word simply because well-known speakers have taught it. Go home and check out whether what we've said is true. Check it with the word. Make sure that you know that in context. I'll, I'll, can I just keep on? Uh, I'm on a roll, Mac. I'm on a roll. Oh, okay, okay. But okay. Do you want to butt in very quickly? And no, no, I'll... go ahead. Okay, thank you. There. I'm rolling. I'm rolling. <laughs> At least you raised the your hand. God. You got <laughs> shot down, but you raised There's, your hand. <laughs> and it's so as to walk in a manner pleasing to him. That's the holiness bit, right? So it's hearing God's word, pleased to him, and make sure that it is you and God in his word, not, not just the speakers. You check it out for yourself, right? And then he goes and say, um, this is the amazing, verse 11, being strengthened with all power. What do you want power for? According to his glorious might for all endurance. You would have thought the power was to preach the gospel with great, great you know, vigor and, and, and have the, all these articulate words to say so that one day I can preach at cross like these guys or something like that. I mean, that, that's not what it's about. It's power for endurance and patience through all the hardships of life. And if you haven't suffered yet, it's only because you haven't lived life long enough. And God's mm. desire is for you to endure Amen. with patience and joy, joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. I want to exhort you just to read Colossians 1. I think that's great steps from there. Sorry, Mac. No, no, it's 
<laughs> so good. Um, now, praise God. I can't, I can't tell you how rare it is to hear a talk like trips at a missions conference. I want to affirm everything the brother said. It was um, so important. Um, the church is often left out of our thinking and missions, and it's hurt missions. So take to heart what he said. In Acts chapter 18, you have this worshiping community in Antioch. They're praying, they're fasting, they're coming together, um, and the Lord speaks to them to set apart Paul and Barnabas for missionary activity. Paul and Barnabas are submitted to the elders of that church and the leadership of that church as they hear what God is directing them to do. Just to add what our brothers, including Tripp, have been saying more specifically, submit yourself to the elders of your church. Go back to them and tell them God has moved in your heart about missions. If it's true, don't lie about it. Go tell them that for two reasons. One, if it's a healthy church, they're going to take hold of you. And they're going to they're gonna love you and, and they're going to help you understand the things you need to grow in to become someone who goes overseas with the gospel to make disciples. If it's not a very healthy church, you're going to be a witness to them. It's going to be the Mark 1, principle where Jesus sends back the leper who's just been healed as proof to those who no longer believe in the temple, as proof to them. Do not underestimate your ability as God moves in your heart to bring about change in your churches. Don't underestimate your ability to do that. You have a voice. And uh, many people will listen to you when they see the, the real, the, the nature of your commitment that comes from the Holy Spirit and from the scriptures. So my, my addition to that is submit to the elders, go home and submit to the elders. You're not going to lose by doing that. All right, so let's, let's get a little more uh, specific for uh, somebody who is thinking, I think the Lord may be leading me to go. How do I know where to go? How do I know to go, how to go, uh, when to go? So I'm going to start with the elders of the church, uh, and there, imagine a pastor's like, huh, okay, sounds good. What, what, what do you do now? Or are we really affirm, so we're saying a less healthy kind of setting, maybe, or maybe more, okay, we want to help you. What are some steps that somebody's going to walk through from that point? Ten, the, the tendency, of course, at that point is look for a mission agency, right? I mean, we tend to, we tend to say that, um, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, mission agencies are parachurch ministries that come alongside the church that help churches in the missionary endeavor. There's, there's temptations for both churches and mission agencies in that process. Uh, back in the 50s, uh, it parallels something that happened back then. Churches offloaded biblical counseling in the 50s, gave it over to professionals. I think recently, in the last decade or two, people, churches have realized, hey, no, wait a second, we got something to say biblically in people's lives for, uh, as we counsel people. Well, the same is somewhat true with mission agencies. Uh, there's a tendency and a temptation both for churches and for mission agencies in this partnership to pursue missions. Churches can often offload all their responsibility for missionaries to a mission agency. And agencies can often just see the church as funding sources. So we have to be, we have to be careful in that partnership. We need to call churches to take hold of their responsibility, not offload or subcontract out. And we need, to, we need agencies to recognize that churches are far more than funding sources, that people need to be submitted to their local churches, and that church is critical. We can't do this without the church. So I would look, I would look as, I, I wouldn't just say, oh, here's a mission agency who goes to China. I'll go with them. I would be, as you submit to the elders, also ask the elders to help you know good mission agencies and, and ask them to do research for you if they don't know. Look to the partnerships that churches have made. We try really hard in Cross to have good mission agencies here for you. But the weight of that can't be borne by just Cross. 
We, there, there's so many good mission agencies out there. So we, I would counsel you, this is what I think, just I would counsel you to find partnerships in your church about good mission agencies mm-hmm. uh, as a kind of a first step past submitting yourself to elders. Okay. And just I, before I, that, I, oh, I'm sorry, Zane. Is that okay? Just before that, a, a, there's the assumption that the church is a healthy one for starters, isn't it? So we just could be so discerning about that. But secondly, uh, it's doing what you think you'll be doing overseas here yes. before going over there. Right? And, and Mac has often said that. He says it so helpfully. It's, it, you don't have a miracle on the plane in order to become a missionary over there. You've got, you've got to see yourself doing that ministry now and the here and now. So if you're actually ministering to those from another culture here, if you're not doing that here, what makes you think you're going to do it over there? If you're not resisting temptation here in terms of the internet, what, do you, what makes you think it's not going to happen over there? There's just as much stuff on the internet there than there is here. So if yeah, wouldn't it be on... great if you just paid, if you could just pay 1500 bucks and get on a plane and presto change, oh, you're an evangelist, right? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be great? I'd, I'd pay that. Uh, that's not going to happen. Yeah. If you're not doing it here, you're not doing it there. Yeah. yeah. I, and I would say, so I mentioned the other day, one of my biggest regrets, probably my top regret from college was uh, um, not plugging into a local church like we're talking about here. Not far behind that uh, when it comes to regrets. Uh, not that the whole purpose of this panel is just to list all the things I wish I'd have done different. and. Uh, we forgive you, David. Thanks. I thank you for releasing me from that. <laughs> yeah. that he does, but I know. Yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> You're like, why are you here? Um, so uh, was uh, I did not realize till my last semester uh, at the University of Georgia, I had a, a speech comm class where I had to do a research project with uh, international students who had just moved to campus. And uh, I just realized I totally missed it. Like the opportunities for making disciples among the nations was right there the whole time. And I just hung out with people who looked like me and talked like me. And, and there, were, there were men and women who had never heard the gospel who were, would long for somebody to go to dinner. And I just totally missed the opportunity to show love. I mean, just period, to show love. And then in the process, obviously, to share the gospel. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to venture to a guess that every single one of us in this room has somewhere within the proximity of where I live opportunities to make disciples cross culturally. So, so when I when I, I actually do deal with with missionary candidates for, for my organization, and when someone first begins begins the conversation, what I tell them is get yourself qualified. Make sure that you are qualified. And what that means is in the fellowship of your church and in accountability to the leadership of your church. Make sure that the things we're looking for are to be found in you. And those, those aren't so complicated, but we are looking for people who are mature, growing disciples of Jesus. We've already mentioned that. Make sure that's built into your life. Uh, we are looking for people who are living a holy life. And, and I'm, I'm just going to say right now, one of the biggest things that keeps people off the mission field is lack of holiness. And specifically, I'm just going to say the word, it's pornography. Uh, my organization requires that you have been, you, you can honestly say that you have been clean for a year. We, we no longer ask if you've ever used it, we ask when was the last time. And if that is an issue for you, and my guess is it is for most of the people in this room, then you need to establish accountability right now. So even for us, we, we discovered that over half of the young men who apply for service with us are not qualified because they admit to recent ongoing use of pornography. So do what has to be done to get that out of your life. You just got to do that. Uh, You also need to be a person who is in in a sound position financially. And, you know, our agencies take good care of us, but we don't get paid a whole lot. And you can't sustain a heavy debt. So I would say for those of you who are younger, if there's any way you can keep from getting another penny of debt to get your education, do so. If you are in debt, do what you need to do to get out of debt in order to be able freely to be deployable uh, around the world. But then another thing that sometimes we Can I pause you right there yeah. real quick? Just uh, uh, I know like the GoFund in the back. I don't know if you've uh, seen them and I don't want to 
point seven thousand people. I don't I don't know if yeah. you guys would be able to cover all of the debt in this room, but uh, they they, uh, they it's an intentional ministry set up to those who are going overseas, uh, and there's obviously an application process and a commitment with that, but to help uh, address. Yeah. Uh, student debt. So I'm just so thankful for that, yeah. that organization that's here. And Sorry. I would also add j j just what these brothers said. If you are going to share the gospel and make disciples, be sharing the gospel and making disciples. And, and doing so in the context of the local church. I just, I, I'm so grateful for the stress here. But literally, it's impossible to do missions without church. And many times our conceptions of how you make a disciple are entirely individualistic. So learn how to make disciples in the context of a local church because that's what we're sending you over there to do. If you are single, you need to be healthy in your singleness. And if you are married, your marriage needs to be steady. It needs to be secure because we're sending you into a situation that's going to put you under a lot of stress. And stress brings out whatever's inside. And we're sinners, so that's what it brings out. And um, you know, your number one responsibility, humanly speaking, if you are married, is to your spouse. And we want to make sure that that's going to stay solid as you go overseas. And then I would also say, especially for those of you who are sort of earlier in your, your academic career, make sure that you are working toward a skill that'll get you among the unreached. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I also highly value solid biblical and theological training. Um, I'm afraid there are those within the, the, the missions community that sort of downplay that. But we're asking you to do, in some ways, an, an even more rigorous task, biblically and theologically, because you need to think well about the truth of the gospel and the implications of the gospel in a setting that's not even your own. Uh, so those are, in many ways, just the kind of the simple things that we ask people to do to get themselves ready. And one more thing I would add, another thing that keeps people off the field is health. And you're going to go to a place that is more physically rigorous than where you live now. And so, just get, get yourself healthy and get yourself in good shape. It, it will be of benefit to you for the rest of your life. And those are those, so that's where you start. You start by making sure in the fellowship of your church that you're ready to go. Yeah. I, so, I so much appreciate the, the, the wisdom and experience um, that's being articulated. I, I think if I could sort of draw out one thing explicitly, particularly where you, where you left off, is particularly those of you who are younger, or, or maybe you're at the sort of high end of the age spectrum for this conference, but you're just now thinking about missions, I think you should probably be thinking in terms of years, not months. Hmm. That, that learning to live well as a Christian and to teach others to live well as Christians, which is if I'm summarizing the task in some ways, well, that's going to take some time mm -hmm. and some practice. And you're going to have to live a little yeah. to see the stresses yeah. bring out various things. Um, this, is, this is not sort of microwave approaches to, to missions. None of what we're talking about. Learning what you need to learn theologically, learning what you need to learn ecclesiologically, learning what you need to learn in terms of personal devotion um, takes time, right? So there's this strange combination of not letting your zeal grow cold, keeping your spiritual fervor for the Lord, and doing all things with patience, mm -hmm. right? And so as you go out of here, I think I just want to put patience on the agenda there and say you, we're probably thinking for most of this room, years to grow this way, mm -hmm. right? Not weeks, not months. Yeah, I would say like urgent patience. Yes, I like that. <laughs> right? I mean, I like some, that. Some, that, that tension, that tension yeah. because, so and, and, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I think, uh, well, let me ask you guys, uh, Particularly if you are moving overseas for, you know, for the duration of your life as far as you know it, uh, like all these things apply. Do the same exact things apply if you're going on a short-term mission trip? Probably not to the level, right? Same level. Not to the same And think healthy short-term <laughs> missions for a second. Now, not to the same yeah. level. So, yes, but, you want to be walking with Jesus. Yeah, you want to, yeah. I mean, some of these things. And then, and then maybe the bar is a bit higher to go uh -huh. for a summer or because there's tons of opportunities right. for students all across this room to go somewhere for a summer, to go somewhere for a semester, go somewhere for a year or two. In fact, I think we would encourage 
not jumping into, okay, I'm spending my life there, and that's the first time I go overseas, that, that there's maybe some steps toward that. And so that can be a part of this growing time. So I, I, I think that's right. Did, did, you're helping me make explicit something I was assuming. I, I was thinking more about sort of career yeah. missionaries mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, so you, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Just I, think, I, that way. I think we want directors of short-term programs to have that in place, you know, to understand where we're going. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, you know, Leanne and I wrote a book on Mac and Leanne's Guide to Short-Term Missions, and it's one of those things where the more you know, the more locked up you are on these questions, you know? I mean, huh. especially after Mez's challenge to us the other, other night. I was wondering, trying to figure out what he was thinking. It just wasn't coming out clear. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah, I wish the brother would speak his mind. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 thought, I thought it was a good challenge. Absolutely. You know, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater eater. Um, because short-term programs and short-term missions have been used powerfully in people's lives. And over time, what seems like maybe a large expenditure of money at the front end reaps enormous fruit down the road. So, I mean, if you amortize that over years, you know, it's, it's uh, if that's the right word. Uh, but it's, it's at the same word. time, I mean, having been on the receiving end of a lot of short-term mission teams, there were some teams we were really glad to see come. And there were some teams we were really glad to see go. Yeah. 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 And the difference between those <laughs> really has to do with, with posture w w when you enter. People who come with a sense of entitlement, people who come with, with expectations of what we're going to do for them, people who come unwilling to live the way we live on the field, uh, people who come with uh, basically viewing it as I got to raise support for a vacation trip. Uh, we don't want you to come. On the other hand, people who come humbly to learn and to serve, those people are a delight yeah. to have. And that, so it makes a world of difference, the posture you, you take when you come on a short-term mission trip. You view it, I mean, we recognize that most of the benefit is to you, not to us. But that's fine if that's part of investment in your long-term growth in maturity in Christ and in preparation for ministry. I, I want to just encourage you to think that the default the default should be thinking about long-term mission service. And the short term is there in preparation for that default thinking. Yeah. Because we're not going over just with a backpack. We want people to go with suitcases for the long term. We want people to go with huge cargoes, you know, there for the long term. Not that we should be buying all of that because we learned last night we shouldn't do that, right? But, we, but we're going long term. That's what I should be thinking. That's what I'm willing to do. And it is a patient thing. In our context, we think it's on average for those who are going long term 10 years from your freshman year to the time that you actually take off on the plane mm, to do all sense. of that. That's yeah. roughly 10 years, right? So it's you do your, your university, then you do it perhaps an internship with the church or, or whatever, then four years of seminary, and then going, if possible. I know that's not possible for everyone, but the more you know, the better, as long as that knowledge is used in love, not to puff up, right? But you need the knowledge of God. That's what's going to keep you and sustain you. It's God who he is and him being your treasure, and you get that deeply drinking from his word. And it is patience, but can I draw your attention again to Colossians 1? It's all endurance and patience with Joy, Amen. giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. That's what keeps you going. So if you're not patient here, you're not going to be patient there. Mm. So think long-term, default. That's not just a, a romantic short-term thing. No. It's not romantic at all, is it? Amen. Mm. I, have I, would... three, I have three concerns in mission. Can I go back to more general yeah, well, you didn't raise your hand, but yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what, there's three big concerns for me about people's preparation for missions. You need to have a stranglehold on the gospel. You need to understand how central that is to missions. You must know it, breathe it, eat it, live it, speak it. You must have a stranglehold on the church. So the gospel, the church, and then also calling uh, your call to the nation. The gospel, the church, and our call to the nations are the three major things that I long for everyone who's seriously thinking about missions to have nailed down in their life. Calling is a big part of that, obviously with the church, that it's confirmed by the church. So work on those things. I would recommend especially a book on ecclesiology, uh, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. Start there. Uh, deeper work uh, called The Church by Mark Dever. Um, 
get a, get a hold of a strong and good ecclesiology so you know where, where you're going. You, we don't want, want you to just talk about church, church, church. Everybody believes in church. Everybody gives lip service to the church. Be able to define a church. I mean, can you do that? You could, you know, you can define a church in about five sentences. It's not that hard. What a church is, what a church does, what is the mission of the church? Those three things you ought to know. Cold about church. Now we can go back. I'll put my hand down. No, it's great. It's great. You know, I, one of the purposes uh, of these panels is to uh, kind of flesh out and draw out some of the practical tensions in how some of these things play out. So I hope, like, urgency and patience. All right, how do we bring those together? So what, is there a recipe for what that looks like? Um, and then, uh, yeah, short term to, to hear from Mez, like, and, and others, like some of the real abuses and unhealthy things that happen there, but then to realize, okay, there's also really healthy things that can happen there. That can be a healthy part of training for long term. It can be a healthy pattern in the life of a sender uh, to be engaged in uh, work around the world through short-term missions, uh, what I would call midterm, a month or two to a year or two, uh, some of those opportunities. And then even like, uh, so I was thinking as Richard, as you were talking about uh, that 10-year picture, so my mind immediately goes to yes for some, uh, but then at the same time for somebody who's getting a nursing degree, engineering degree, going and working in a, another city, not going to necessarily be leading a church planning team in the same way that somebody else might be leading a church planning team. That, uh, so is the same level of theological education the same exact for everybody on the field? I would say pastors have more theological education than, yeah. uh, and so leaders of church planning teams are going to have more. So, so don't, so just live in that tension, uh, press in to the Spirit of God with the, in the context of your church with the Word of God before you. And the good thing is, God wants this mission to happen in your life more than you do. He wants His glory to be made known among the nations more than you do. He, is, he wants it so much, He's put His very Spirit inside of you to lead and guide and direct your steps. So abide in Him. Like I, the three words I just, I just continually encourage folks with is surrender, like my life, on the table before the Lord, just continually, what do you want me to do? Uh, wherever you want me to be, as, as I think you said, Richard, like a sender is always open to becoming a goer at any moment. Yeah. So having those open hands at all times, surrender and then abide, abide in the word, in prayer, in obedience to the Lord, uh, just seeking him in the context of a church, obeying him, making disciples, growing in holiness. Like continue. when you are surrendered to him and abiding in him, I think, so surrender, abide, rest. I just think there's a rest that we, as we trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not on our understanding, in all our ways we're acknowledging him, that he makes our path straight. And uh, so I, I pray that that will be the case. Like if that marks our lives, a surrender to him, a continual abiding in him, I think there's a rest we can have that he's going to lead and guide us in ways that we couldn't, couldn't imagine right now or couldn't plan right now uh, that are going to be far better than what we could have imagined or planned. So.